The book of Ecclesiastes is a big, funky Latin word that means the teacher. Um, some say the preacher or the teacher. Uh, who knows who wrote Ecclesiastes? Here's why we're studying it, is because of who wrote it. Um, let's have nobody talk unless you got your hand up first and I call on your name. Andrew? Amanda? Noah? I didn't say one yet. Go to Ecclesiastes. Who knows who wrote the book of Ecclesiastes? Yeah, thank you very much. Solomon. Um, Solomon, David's son, who takes his throne from him. We've kind of already dead and buried David. I want to do one lesson because next week we're doing a special Passover. The week after that we don't have youth group. So I didn't want to do one lesson, take two weeks off, and then do part two of the next series. So uh, we're going to read something by Solomon. What do we know about Solomon? I know we haven't studied him for years, but I think everybody in this room should know one specific thing about Solomon. God gave him wisdom and riches and everything because he asked for wisdom. Yeah. Um, a couple of days after David dies, Solomon, his son, becomes king. And God comes to him and says, because of the special relationship I had with your father, kind of like the, oh, you guys ever see the movies where somebody rubs a bottle and a genie pops out? God shows up to Solomon and says, because of the special relationship I had with your father, two things. I'm going to let you build the temple. Um, and second of all, because David had asked to build the temple, and God said, no, you're, you're a man of blood. You're a warrior. I don't want a man of blood to build my temple, but I'll let your son. And David said, thank you, because he knew how powerful that would be, that his son would be the one who built the temple. And second of all, he says, I'll give you anything you want. I'll give you fame, wealth, power, whatever it is you want, victories in battle, anything, I'll give it to you. And Solomon said, your people are so great. This job is so huge. Give me wisdom. And God was very happy with that answer. So God said, because you asked for that, I'll give you everything you could have asked for. Also, I'm going to make you the wisest man that ever lived. So you and I, no matter how hard we study, we will never become as wise as Saul, Solomon. Um, no one before him is as wise as him. So let me start this by saying, Ecclesiastes, this is going to be over our heads. Why? Because who wrote it? The, smart, the, smart, the wisest man, the smartest man who ever lived. The man who, like... The simple stuff to him would confuse you and I. Um, and the only one who could confuse him would probably be the God Almighty, his creator. So, this is going to be overheads. We're going to struggle with this today. And you know what? That's okay. Because, uh, say you guys that play sports, do you get better playing against first graders or do you get better playing against people just a little bit better than you? Okay? So, to be freshmen and sophomores, you want to get better, play against seniors. Okay? Don't play against kindergartners. If you want to improve, because he's actually, he writes it in Proverbs, as iron sharpens iron. It takes something equal to you or better than you to make you better. And so we're going to grind ourselves here on the grinding stone of Ecclesiastes, on Solomon's wisdom. We're going to let him peel us back and take, take a little bit off the top and uh, teach us a little bit. So um, we're just going to say a few things. Oh, I'm going to totally erase this. They're, uh, they're changing one of the lights out here, and they've got a hand crank that goes up, 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 as you go, ch -ch -ch -ch, and it makes a whiny noise. That's like that. a really creepy way to do I didn't write that, Dan. Lauren, thank did. you. What are you talking about? It says Lauren P. Yeah. It is signed what are the Lauren P. I'm sure we have lots of Lauren P's in this room. Okay. Hi, Lauren. That's a good one. So I got beaten, knocked out by a bunch of Lauren <laughs> by someone who likes By someone who likes to put people down. Okay. Um, somebody read for us the first two verses. I want to start the way, um, and actually guys, this, the, the teaching or the preaching, as it's titled, Ecclesiastes is a big word, I told you that, this is meant to be a sermon, okay? So this is like a 20, you can sit in your house and read it for 20, 25 minutes. You'll go from start to finish. And I'm guessing it's Solomon's best one because it's the only one we got. He wrote Proverbs also, but Proverbs is just like a hit and miss. It's just a... So it talks about wife, talks about your children, talks about your slaves, talks about your family, talks about money. It's, it's, he's all over the map. I always assume Proverbs is a book that he set by his bed. And whenever he got a wise thought, he wrote it down. And today we call that the book of Proverbs. Ecclesiastes is the only thing Solomon wrote that's one, one fluid train of thought. And it's a beautiful book. But we're going to do some board work here. You guys have a blank piece of paper, so I'm going to ask you to put a pen to it. And uh, we're going to take some notes together. Somebody read the first two verses, if you would, please. Thank you, Rachel. No, I need a pen. Oh, you're killing me. Yeah. Okay, would you? Who's got Ecclesiastes open? Thank you, Noah. It's first two verses. 
The words of the teacher, son of David, king in Jerusalem. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Utterly, utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. Okay, what is meaningless in life? Meaningless. Everything. No, what is meaningless? He just read it. Everything. Everything is meaningless. <laughs> what is it? Solomon has one thing to say to us. He wants us to grab one thought. It's a good sermon. This is a great sermon. He wants us to understand one thing. What is the one thing he wants us to understand? Everything is Okay, let's see what he let's see what he means. Um, so who's got one? Well, chapter one, verse three. One three. Hey guys, if you volunteer fast, this lesson will go fast. If we all just sit here and stare at the teacher, it's going to take forever. Go. Uh, what does man gain from all his labor at which he to toils under the sun? Generations come and generations go, but the earth remains forever. This okay. Was that that, that that was all three, wasn't it? Okay. Three, four, three, four, oh yeah, you're killing me. Uh, I just wanted three. Um, what did he try? What did Solomon try to find meaning in life? Solomon wanted to have fulfillment. He wanted to be happy. What did he try? Excellent. He tried work. Okay. He tried to do a lot of stuff. He tried to build a lot of buildings. He built a temple. He, he built the city of Jerusalem. He built huge things. Did this make him happy? No. All right, let's move on. 13 and 14 of chapter 1. Who's got that for us? Say your name. No, I go. I applied my mind to study and to explore my, my wisdom all that is done under the heavens. But a heavy burden God has laid on mankind. I have seen all the things that are done under the sun. All of them are meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Okay, Solomon wanted to be happy. He tried building a lot of stuff, doing a lot of work, accomplishing a lot. Did that make him happy? No. So what did he try next, Mr. Noah? So he tried to he tried to study and explore. Like he started just like uh -huh. he thought, if I'm smarter, I'll be happy. Mm -hmm. I'll have the fulfilled life. I'll have everything I want if I'm just a little bit smarter. If I have a better education, more degrees on the wall. Did this make him happy? <laughs> Unfortunately, it did not. Somebody read two, one through three. Who's next? Thank you, Macy. I'll read it. Okay, go ahead, Andrew. I said to myself, come now, I will test. Well, that's, hold on. I said to myself, come now, I will test you with pleasure to find out what is good. But that also proved to be meaningless. Laughter, I said, is madness, and what does pleasure accomplish? I tried cheering myself with wine and embracing folly, my mind still guiding me with wisdom. I wanted to see what was good for people to understand. The heavens during the few days of your life. I tried doing a lot. It didn't make me happy. I tried getting really smart. It didn't make me happy. What I try next? Somebody say. What's that? Wine. Okay. Um, party, but what was I going to say? Yeah, yeah. Ple pleasures is what I thought of earlier today. He tried physical pleasures. Hey, I'll try getting drunk a lot. I'll try laughing. I'll uh, pay for all the circuses to come to town. I'll have people, comedians, try to entertain me. And at the end of the day, I was still saying, meaningless, meaningless. All of life is meaningless. But my search isn't over. Let's continue. Somebody read 2, 8, and 9, if you would, please. Who's next? Dusty. I made silver and gold for myself in the treasure of kings and provinces. I acquired men, women, seniors, and in a... Harem. Harem, as well as the delights of the heart of man. I became better by far than anyone in Jerusalem. All right, that's where I went in it off right there. What does he try next? I got lots of women slaves. I acquired a harem. What do you say? Well, if you own them, it's not prostitution. He tried sex. Uh, we actually know later Solomon had 300 wives and 1,000 concubines. He had 1,300 women that he could have sex with, and it was legal. He tried sexual pleasure. But you know what? Wilt Chamberlain said he's to have that many. And uh, there were probably some rap stars that tried to have that many basketball players. Um, he tried sex. At the end of having sex with every woman he could imagine, was he happy? No. He was more miserable than before. But he didn't stop. Solomon's a wise man, and he had all the money. I mean, he's a king of one of the most powerful kingdoms of the world at that time. So he had the ability to try everything. Let's go next. Who's got 4, 14 through 16? Let's see what he tries next. 
And honestly, kids, he sounds to me like some, a lot of people that I know, people my age that I grew up with, they've tried everything, and they're still not happy. Who's got 4, 14 through 16? Elizabeth, thank you. We're part of the show, I'm just going to call on you. The youth may have come from prison to the kingship, or he may have been born in poverty within his kingdom. I saw that all who lived and walked under the sun followed the youth, the king's successor. So that was all of it? Wait, 14 through 16? Yeah. Oh. There was no end to all the people who were before them, but those who came later were not pleased with his successor. This, too, is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Okay, it was really hard. What he's saying is, you could be a poor little kid who was a slave and didn't have a penny. And by the time you die, you're now the king. What is he talking about here? How, how can we boil that down? I thought of one word, but can you guys think of one word? How would you say somebody who had nothing to all of a sudden have the whole world? Okay. Oh, success. That's a great word. I thought of advancement. I like success better. Um, okay. He tried success. He tried accomplishing stuff. Did that make Solomon the wisest man ever happy? No, it did not. Somebody read 5 verse 10 if you would, please. Thank you, Andrew. Whoever loves money never has money enough. Whoever <laughs> loves wealth is never satisfied with his income. This too is meaningless. Okay, so what else did he try? Hey guys, can you think of anything that people try today to make them happy that's not up there on the board? And that's everybody I know. I know people who have tried to be busy. I know guys that are workaholics, even some ladies that are workaholics. I know people who try to get all the degrees in front of their name and the initials afterwards. I know people who try to party all the time, people who try to have sex with as many people as possible. I know people who try popularity, wealth. And actually, the, the richest people I've ever known are honestly the saddest people I've ever known. I know one guy's the vice president of a company called Hilti. They make tools for all kinds of stuff around the world. And he was filthy rich. And he was miserable. He was asking Amy and I to basically raise their kids for him. And it's like, come on. Uh, and then you guys have been with me in the Dominican Republic. You know some of the poorest people we've ever met are some of the happiest, happiest people we've ever met. Um, we've tried all these things, and everything is meaningless. Um, we've got a hole in our soul. God created you on purpose, incomplete. Why? Because from the very time that he took dust out of the ground and breathed life into it, he wanted you to desire a relationship with him. So God created you incomplete on purpose so that you would seek him. And he promises, if you seek me, you will, who knows this verse? If you seek me, you will, don't, yeah, don't be afraid, guys, we're in church. <laughs> don't be afraid to quote scripture. If you seek me, you will find me. And God knows. He created you on purpose that way. But yet we try to stuff square pegs into round holes all the time. We think, if I can just get the right boy to like me, the right girl to like me, if I just have enough fun, enough of a party, if I can just have more sex or more money or more fame, then I will be happy. Would I be more happy if I have more of whatever stuff I cram into my life? If I get that great job and that college degree and that great spouse and that great house, am I going to be happy? No, because what's the only thing that can make me happy? Turn to the end of the book, if you would please, chapter 12. I want us just to focus on two verses, 1 and 13. I want to end the way Solomon chose to end. Because... It, when I read this, I read the thoughts of, a, of an old man with a lot of regrets. Man, I tried this, I tried that, I tried this, I tried that. And everything I tried made me more miserable than I was before I tried it. And then at the end of his life, he finally figures it out. And guys, parents that love their kids want to tell them all the kind of wisdom that they can because they don't want the kids to make the same mistakes that they made. And here's what I'm seeing. Solomon's writing this for his son. And you and I are, are um, fortunate enough to read it. Could uh, somebody pick up those two verses nice and loud and nice and slow? So that we don't, with Rachel, nice and proud, if you would, so that we understand what he's saying. Remember your Creator in the days of your youth, before the days of trouble come, and the years approach when you will say, I find no pleasure in them. No, now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. What was the last thing Solomon tried? Should have been the first thing Solomon tried. 
What's that? God. He tried a relationship with his God. And then he found happiness. Meaning. He found purpose. He found a reason to wake up in the morning. He found every, he, he understood why he was created. Finally, at the end of his life. And if you read, when, you, when we study, or we're not going to study Solomon here this year, but if you ever study Solomon in the book of First Kings, that's what you find. You find a young man who's got everything and is not happy and is doing crazy decisions. Then by the end of the life, he kind of pulls it all together and leaves a legacy. But what a shame that it took him that many years and that much time to pull it all together. Let me end with a final thought. And then we're, oh, D group assignments. Um, I want us to have extended time on prayer and prayer charts. If you need a scripture to go over, I skip chapter 3. And so I'd like you to do the first eight verses of chapter 3 if you have time. If you run out of conversation, just ignore me. Um, if you run out of conversational material, because it stands alone and you teachers, you don't need me to tell you what to say about that. You'll understand it completely. Uh, 3 verses 1 through 8. Powerful stuff. Um, beautiful stuff. So, um, and just, I just want to make a personal thought to you guys. Um, I just want to tell you guys how much I appreciate this group of kids I've got right now. Most of you guys, I know there's a few absent today, but I really appreciate you guys. Um, those of you who are, have been here, like, for years, two years ago, I looked in the room, and every day I had three or four kids. And most of the time, they spent the lesson making fun of what I said, or they, two or three of them had this habit of whenever I'd say a sentence, they would repeat it back but with a twist, making it kind of like a sexual thing. And it was just so difficult. And honestly, I had several nights I would go home on a Wednesday and I thought, God, I'm not reaching these kids. The church of 500 people, I got like three kids in class and they don't care. That, and I remember telling God, I think I'm in the wrong profession and I think I need to find something. You know, if you can't do what you're doing, then do something else. So I remember thinking, it's time for me to go. And it's time for me to get out. And then this group of guys, you guys who are the older ones, came in and things have changed. And now, look, I look up and I see like 30 kids and you guys are here. I mean, you guys are making eye contact. You're listening. You're learning. And I say something like, hey, I need help at 2 o'clock on Saturday and 25 of you show up. Or like I say, I need help on Saturdays at 2 to make the church look like a church instead of a gym. And you guys show up and you're great to work with and you're a lot of fun. So I just have never really publicly, I guess, said thank you. I brag about you all the time when you're not around. But I thought it was fair. Uh, God says, give praise to whom praise is due. So thank you guys for being who you are and for restoring my faith in youth and me and church. And So I appreciate that about you. Um, let's go ahead and go to D groups. We'll have a I